uh, recognize Annie. Uh, you have all talked to Annie uh, and Eleni, who have been really the uh, pivotal in the organization of this forum. So Annie and Eleni, my colleagues, thank you very much for uh, all the great work you have done. So if you don't mind, give them uh, a round of applause. There is Annie running around. Thank you, Annie, so much. See, I'm the number two in my company because I have wonderful people working with me being the number one. So. so we're going to follow on with um, similar um, themes to uh, the last uh, session and earlier in the day. But this time, uh, we're going to be hearing from ship owners. And uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have with us uh, ship owners representing cross-section of the industry. Uh, so we have uh, Dry Bulk, which is uh, represented by Mats Berglund, and uh, also uh, Hing Cha has uh, some uh, Dry Bulk vessels as well as does uh, Jack Shu. Uh, we have energy, whether it be oil or gas, represented by mm. Yong Xin Wang, who is president of China Merchant. Um, and then we have containers represented by Bing Chen. So, um, what we're going to do is look at uh, five particular topics, and I'm going to ask um, each of the panelists uh, to uh, lead on one of those topics and then throw the issue out to the remaining panelists. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, finish off by asking each of them what is the biggest driver, risk, and opportunity in their business today and in five years' time, if different. So the uh, topics that we're going to look at uh, specifically are regulation, environmental compliance, technology, trade flows, and access to capital and finance. So uh, to uh, Jack Shu, could I please put the, the first uh, uh, topic, which is regulation. Um, the former chairman of Intercargo, John Plasticardis, has been quoted as saying that as shipping executives, you risk spending more time managing regulations than managing ships. Do you believe that we are over-regulated? And do you see increasing regulation heading in the right way or the wrong way? Jack. Regulation um, is kind of a double-edged sword, I think. Um, it can head in the right way or it can head in the wrong way. Uh, but maybe I can just back up a little bit. Um, as an industry uh, with vessels trading internationally, uh, different countries, the last thing uh, we need is regional or local regulation. Um, so, uh, and thus, uh, we are in support of, of a single regulatory, an international regulatory board body, as we all know through the IMO. Um, so we've come through maybe the last 10 years of, of uh, many different regulations, and admittedly, I believe it is uncomfortable in dealing with those kind of regulations as we've seen in the past years. Um, but frankly speaking, I think in the next five, ten years, there'll be more forthcoming. And so perhaps one way of looking at it is just part of a change in the landscape of the business that we're in. Um, so that's sort of my take on uh, overall regulation. Maybe if I could also add that um, perhaps what we are looking for in regulation is not only just the one regulatory body, but the consequence of the regulation that arises from that is to ensure a level playing field. And what I mean by that is um, that there is um, no distortion, um, there's no unfavoring or unfavoring of any particular sector, so that there is uh, you know, a good degree of fair market competition that can ensue from that. 
Um, I think if we look at um, in the context of what, may be, what we may be seeing in the future with carbon dioxide, uh, it remains to be seen how this will uh, pan out in terms of uh, whether through market-based mechanisms, uh, levies, um, whatever else. Uh, but what I hope to see is that perhaps the market, well, after the regulation comes out, the number one, that it is um, enforceable in a fair way and also creates a marketplace where the market will find the solution in terms of the technology that's necessary. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, I mean, the main uh, font of regulation is the IMO. Do you think that uh, works effectively? Um, I think so, yes. Uh, yes, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think there are um, aspects of the IMO that perhaps one could read as, uh, could, be, could be improved. Um, I think just the nature of the politics of the various nations uh, from, the, from the developed countries versus the non-developed countries, each country has its own perspective on its own, in, protecting its own interests. But I think at the end of the day, everyone has to compromise. Um, and I think we've seen all that um, shake itself out over the years. Thank you, Jack. Um, any comments from uh, other members of the panel? Um, Hing, would you have any comments? You're closest to me, so. Um, I agree with what Jack said. Um, the IMO 2020 self cap being a case in point is very effective in that we all are compliant. You won't encounter any ship owner that doesn't consider compliance at utmost priority for us. But where it doesn't work so well is the method of compliance. Do all ship owners agree that using scrubber is necessarily the best way forward? Some do, some don't. And I think one tough lesson that most ship owners have come to learn through the IMO 2020 is that the ship owning community as a whole should come together and discuss and come to not a uniform, but some sort of consensus on what might be the best ways to proceed. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Well, Hing, Hing you've, you've led us into the next uh, topic, actually, which is um, IMO 2020. Um, and um, Matt Berglin, if I can put it to you, um, as I understand it, um, only about 10% of the world's fleet um, has scrubbers uh, at the moment, um, or, in, or intended in the immediate um, time. Um, so 90% will be seeking to um, uh, burn uh, compliant fuel. Um, wh what's, your, what's your company strategy in relation to uh, IMO 2020? And um, do, you, do you think the fuel will be, the, the compliant fuel will be um, easily available? And uh, do you have any comments on scrubbers? Yeah, so our company, we have about 230 to 240 handy size and supermax bulkers on the water typically. And about 85 to 90% of those will comply by burning 0.5% uh, compliant fuel. Uh, and that is 100% uh, 100 of our handy size as well. Whether you go for scrubbers financially has a lot to do with the size of the ship, as, as everybody knows. And the higher fuel consumption, the more attractive to, to look at scrubbers. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Jack mentioned uh, some very good points about uh, uniform regulations and Hing Chao as well. We would have been much better off with a ban on HFO period, in, in our view. That would have been a level playing field and Everybody would have known exactly what to do. The oil companies, the bunker suppliers would have worked hard on, on making sure we have enough. Instead, we, we now have different ways to comply and we have to live with that. So our company also had to accept that a lot of our competing Supermax owners went for scrubbers. Uh, and we are installing scrubbers on, on some of our Supras. Uh, as I mentioned, 10 to 15% of our fleet will have, uh, will have scrubbers. Uh, there are benefits uh, with uh, having the two options because we can schedule our scrubber fitted ships against long uh, seagoing voyages where we can access cheap HFO, etc. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, we do think that uh, both types of fuel will be available. Maybe we have to plan a little bit extra up to, to, to get it, but we do not think that uh, availability will be a major problem. Uh, That's a very interesting comment, particularly coming from somebody with handies, because your handies are going to go um, to lots of small ports everywhere around the world. It but the handies Africa, are burning low sulfur yep. fuel, right? And low yeah. sulfur fuel is the, is the big yes. volume commodity going yeah. forward. So yeah. we do not think that that will be a problem. Uh, will there be more scrubbers? We don't think so. We think it's too late. So, you know, the fuel spread is widest in the front. So unless you made a decision, you know, a long time ago to get a slot and to, to get the technology lined up, and get the scrubbers installed, you, you reap the benefits up front and, and not in the longer term. How, uh, how do you think the pricing will uh, play out? Well, the forward curve, uh, as expected, uh, is pointing to a, a narrowing fuel spread going forward. So the fuel spread right now is about $280 per ton between HFO and, um, and 0.5. But in the second half of, uh, of 2020, it's more like uh, 220, and 2021 is more like 180. Right, so if you catch this train a bit late, it's probably yeah. probably not uh, not worth it. Uh, yeah, those are our major yeah. views on. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, any comment from others on the panel in relation to 2020 and scrubbers? No. Well, um, building on that, um, Hing. Um, sorry to come back to you again, uh, but. Um, what are your comments and views on um, generally decarbonization moving forward? Um, maybe you'd like to comment a little bit about uh, whether you think it's uh, feasible, whether the, um, the target of the IMO is feasible that we've just heard about in the earlier session, um, what your views are on the um, Poseidon principles, um, much loved by, by Western banks at the moment. Um, and um, also um, the idea of a fuel levy, uh, which was actively promoted by the uh, Global Maritime Forum um, two or three weeks ago. Um, and you might also say something about your views on all these different fuels. It was quite interesting, the last session, about the, the whole range of different fuels that might be available in the future. So, nice, easy topic for you. That's quite a few questions to answer. I'll try to proceed one by one. Um, I think probably a good place to start is look at uh, global energy consumption to begin with. At the moment, I think 86%, if my figures are correct, are fossil fuels. Um, we expect by, that by 2050, the number will drop to about 56%. So rough, only roughly half of the global use of energy um, in something like 30 years' time will be fossil fuels. So if we compare that to the prediction we're making or the measures that the industry as a whole are proposing for shipping, are we saying that in 30 years' time we will still be not only using fossil fuels but also quite polluting diesel oil? And I think these are really so searching questions that as traditional industry, we really start to ask ourselves. Um, it's not a simple issue because there's regulations, obviously, which is going to play a big role, already has. 2030, um, on the horizon in 10 years' time, it's a carbon dioxide emission reduction of 30% compared to 2008 level. And by 2050, we're looking at a reduction of 50% uh, compared to 2008 level. If everyone goes slow steaming, as some ship owners are suggesting, we can probably get by ooh, just about by 2030 but we are hardly planning for 2050. And as ship owners, when we invest in assets, no matter what strategy we have, we are making a long-term heavy investment of an asset that will have a shelf life of at least 20 years, 25 years in, in, in the past, and probably going down, but still not much short of 16, 17 years. And the first question you have to ask yourselves is if I buy a ship today, what sort of asset value it will retain in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time. So I think these are all very important questions we have to ask ourselves. And if we look more deeply into these questions, I think some will begin to realize that decarbonization, it's 
something we have to embrace. And so steaming is going to be an important part of the equation. Can we imagine that in 10 years' time, or if, even in 30 years' time, that the global fleet will all be renewable energy or even burning something LNG? Maybe not. However, will slow steaming be the full equation? Definitely no. Thank you. Could I ask each of the panelists whether the issue regarding fuel in the future is discouraging uh, new building? Absolutely, 100%. I cannot understand the board that today makes a decision to go to a new building yard to order a new ship. Because that ship has an engine that's designed to burn heavy fuel oil. It, it's amazing to me that, that the order book is the way it is. And we have to stop shooting ourselves in the foot by building too many ships. The, f the fleet speed, as Martin Stopford just pointed out, is 11 knots or 11 and a half when it comes to handy-sized bulkers. It can be 13. We don't need more ships. Yeah. Let's make some money so we can save up to, to, have, to, to afford real new technology that is not you know, heavy fuel oil engines. How can you do that? So when do, when do you think it's going to become clearer as to which fuel is going to win? I mean, it's a bit like in the sort of the video war, you know, which tape was going to win or was it CDs or DVDs and all this kind of thing. Um, when do you think it will become more apparent? I, I think we heard a lot of encouraging, you yeah. know, buy-in from the industry, buy-in from IMO. IMO regulation is helping, regulation is pushing and the industry is buying into it. I think there will be a lot of research done, and you know, I'm always pushing it. Need is the innovation's best uh, driver, or whatever the saying is, mm. right? So, yeah. but whether that is you know, seven years or 10 years, or you know, I don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow, uh, but, but it, it, it will happen, it can happen. Jack, yes? So earlier I mentioned about um, regulation and putting a price on carbon dioxide emissions um, but generally, I would guess that uh, currently we are at a, a 3.5 uh, sulfur uh, per ton cost, say $400, $450. Uh, come 1st of January, we have to buy low sulfur, call that 550 or 600 range. Um, but if there is an additional component of cost because of emissions on carbon dioxide, that adds another, say, $200. So we're at um, looking at around $900 a ton type of cost. I think that kind of environment might be the correct setting to encourage alternative fuels to come into the fray. So I think, I think that's the environment that um, uh, IMO wants to create mm -hmm. by 2023 with the framework uh, the deadline that they're going to come out. Right. Thank you for that. H having said that, I'm, I hasten to add that as ship owners, we are always very cost-sensitive. Cost, um, and it's important for everyone to realize that ship owners, ship operators, we are not the bad guys. We are a part of a much bigger global machine. And the reason why we are using, at the moment, until uh, January 2020, the heavy fuel oil is because the global economy is structured that way, that all the unwanted leftover of refining process is dumped to ship owners to get rid for, for the rest of the world. Ship owners as a whole, if given the level playing field and right conditions, we are ready to embrace change because that is the future for all humanity. But to do that, we are going to need the support from charters, but also from consumers to realize that there is a cost to environmentalism. And that is a real cost. Thank you very much for that. Um, moving on to technology, which is um, connected to the previous uh, issue. Um, Bing Chen from um, C-SPAN, um, what's your view on the technological changes which are taking place and are likely to, to happen in the future? Um, are, are you optimistic about them? Do you have any comments about any particular technical changes? Yeah, the, the, you know, we operate about uh, close to 120 vessels. Um, we see the technology change in three areas. One is the uh, data. I think a continued use of the data, uh, which is actually uh, continue to drive the operational efficiencies. This is one of the areas today, I think uh, as we speak, it is actually uh, widely being uh, used uh, between the owners and the charters where 
uh, we are able to leverage the data, uh, being able to improve the loadability, improve the voyage planning. Um, so therefore, that saves a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I would say the cost and improve the efficiency. So the data, I think it's one of the areas today our customers, uh, each every one of them, have a so-called war room with all the screens where they're monitoring the vessels, you know, in terms of the speed, the, the, the routes, and, uh, you know, the port call waiting times. So therefore, I think that's the area today um, is continue to drive the efficiency, and I think that's going to continue to accelerate going forward. The other part is the technology. I think the technology with the human learnings, with the, uh, you know, particularly with the shipboard, area where um, I think we see a, a trend where some of those functions that's being you know, carried out on, on board can potentially move um, offshore, where that a, you know, similar to the port operations where a, a group of people can you know, take out certain functions with the systems, with the machine learning capabilities, be able to uh, control the vessels uh, together with the people on board. And that is an area I think that uh, going forward will be uh, have some you know uh, immediate uh, uh, applications. Uh, the third area is it's more of um, as what the you know the, the speakers just talked about is uh, IMO 2020, IMO 2030, and 2050. I think with the new regulations, with the technology that is uh, required uh, in terms of the fuel consumption, environmental requirements, uh, we see. Um, you, you know the the lower sulfur, uh, the, sorry, uh, low sulfur. Um, uh, uh, you know, as the as the fu as the fuel, but also um, I think the lower steaming. Um, and and the one thing that we talked about is um, you know LNG. With LNG, actually, it took about 20 years to, to to develop right now, become one of the alternatives. So you're talking about the you know the speed in 2030 and 2050. Um, and I think the technology today um, is still yet to, uh, to be tested and to be confirmed that it's out there to be able to develop that kind of, um, you know, carbon-free by 2050. I don't think um, today the technology is already there. Um, but I, I think that, that is an area is going to, you know, requires a lot of technology to, uh, to drive the, uh, the, the compliance into the, into the future. And are you building ships at the moment? Uh, we are not building the ships, actually. Uh, you know, just uh, yeah. I, I think it's it's a good it's a good thing in a way that regulation today, um, I think, as Matt said, actually deterred the new ship building, which is why we are not building any ships. Uh, in as industry, I think that's a good positive development because from the supply side, it's actually you know right now we're still at. Uh, record low about 10.7% uh, in terms of uh, uh, new build uh, to the entire fleet ratio. So that is uh, quite a uh, healthy ratio. If you're looking at 10.3, it's about 11%. Divided, average the vessel is going to take three years to build. So it's about 3% uh, 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 you know, growth per annum. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's on the positive side. And the not so much of a you know, positive side is, is that uh, you know, the regulation, that's, as I said, that requires the, uh, you know, these, these, um, uh, the, the compliance. And I think today, from, a, from an economic standpoint, I think Hin just mentioned, um, every business, I think before we, you know, obviously we need to be uh, environmental compliant, absolutely. But at the same time, you have to be as a business, you have to be economically viable, meaning you need to make money. Mm. How are you going to be able to make money? Meanwhile, your cost is significantly increased. And that's a, that's a fine balance, I think, as, um, as an industry, you know, as a whole, because the liners and then cascading down to the ship owners and to everybody else along the value chain. And this is a fundamental question. I think it's, it's a fine balance. Um, you, you know, you need to be able to, you know, have those regulations that is, uh, that is, uh, you, you know, one is a practical, two is, is economically viable. Thank you. Um, any comments from the panel on that? I think that was very comprehensive. Thank you very much. Um, Yong Xin Vang, um, 
trade flows in your area of, of energy, which will be presumably oil and gas. Um, how, how do you see those playing out um, over the now and over the next few years? And, and, and do you see them being impacted by these trade wars and sanctions that uh, are taking place? I mean, I, I was reading as far as your company's concerns in trade winds um, about the, the impact um, of uh, sanctions on Costco and, and how that's affected um, in a positive way your, your, your business. Uh, it's a big problem and it's a very important problem. Uh, uh, for the reason of the, some uh, word maybe touched to the sensitive word and topic, uh, please allow me to uh, ex express my question. Uh, use Mattery。呃，各位好，我是来自招商局的王永新。那么大家都知道，现在的这个整个世界航运呢，面临着一个非常严峻的形势。那么不仅是来自于各个经济体增长的乏力，更重要的是来自于我们这个世界呢，就是
you could summarize in, um, in about two minutes in English um, what oh. you've just said, oh. the, okay. the main point. Yeah, uh, we know. We should uh, keep a positive and optimistic to the futures market. Uh, it's, uh, it's a first. And the secondary, we think uh, uh, we should uh, take some new technology and the new business model to change the synchronous to fit the variety market uh, changing trends. Yeah. Thank you very much. L let me try if yeah. I can add to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to see if I can help my friend. Mr. Ah, okay. Um, so there are four main areas which are of concern. Um, first of all, as we all know, um, global shipping in general is going through a lot of disruptions. The first disruption, as you mentioned, uh, comes about as a result of the so-called the trade war be between the US and China. But at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of new trade routes which are being established concomitantly in different parts of the world. So I think that is the first point. The second point is that at the same time as the disruptions as a result of trade wars and political, geopolitical factors, technology and environment regulations is another very important disruptor to global trade. These bring a lot of challenges to global shipping as a whole, but also a lot of opportunities. In response to those, um, first of all, the new technologies, um, new, form, new forms of partnerships can come about as a way to enhance profitability. So how shipping as a whole can go about to reform the way we do business, to come up with new business models will be absolutely critical and offers new opportunities for different new partnerships. And the fourth point is the emerging new markets which are yet to be developed. So for example, if we cast our mind back 30, 40 years ago, China was not so important on the global stage. Now it's dominant. So going forward, we could also see the rise of new destinations, new trade routes being established in the emerging markets. Mr. Wang, please correct me if I've oh, recapped correctly. You. Good translator. <laughs> <laughs> At your service, my friend. Thank you. Uh, Bing Chen, could I ask you a, 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 another question? Um, and that's in relation to um, capital and, and, and finance. Um, we are, after all, at the Capital Link Forum. Um, and um, obviously, there's a whole um, palette of finance which is, is available, and um, each has its place. Um, we have the, the leasing from the Chinese and Japanese, uh, particularly private equity. Obviously, the banks, um, capital markets, um, alternative finance of various kinds. Um, which do you think is the, is the most pre prevalent and most relevant to, to, to your business? Okay, that's a great question. I think in terms of finance, in, um, in general, it will have to look at the business itself. And I think it you know, depends on the type of business. The, you know, we're talking about shipping here whether it's a bulk, whether it's a tanker, whether it's a container or cruise, that, that, you know, that the different type of uh, assets would have a different uh, financing. And then you have to look at the different uh, uh, format of the owners, whether it's a public company, it's a private company, um, and also that depends on the fleet size that also have corresponding uh, you know, financing alternatives. Um, for C-SPAN specific, I, I think we have the uh, full access to the to the, to the both the traditional financing as well as to the um, you know more of a, a innovative financing um, we do uh, you know in terms of a capital structure today uh, we do have a full access to you know both the secured unsecured uh, you know debt and equity uh, financing um, and in terms of uh, you know specifics of the uh, what you're talking about, the, you know, in, in terms of the Chinese leasing company, the Japanese uh, JELCO. Um, add to that, uh, we just recently launched uh, $1.5 billion of uh, uh, portfolio financing, which is, uh, you know, equivalent of uh, asset-based financing, similar to securitization, but it's in a private format. And uh, this is $1.5 billion uh, financing allows us to have the uh, flexibility to be able to add and subtract the vessels as we see necessary. Right. Also, that we will be able to, uh, you know, adjust the 
the amortization as we see uh, fitted. Um, and in terms of a pricing, it's also very competitive. Actually, it's a lower uh, cost relatively to the traditional secured financing. And plus, uh, with this you know, 1.5 billion of, uh, of, of a portfolio finance, we actually can consolidate more than 15 traditional financing into one. So that significantly reduce the administrative uh, you know, task in, in, in uh, monitoring, reporting the, the covenants. Yeah. So um, we are quite optimistic uh, in terms of uh, you, you know, the development in, uh, in, in different type of financing. However, I think one of, the, one of the key fundamentals is that you need to have a certain basis and in this, uh, you know, portfolio financing, for example, you do need to address the, you know, the diversification in terms of the assets, the customer, the age of the vessels, the, the, the you know, the underlying uh, charter terms, uh, the geographic uh, location, and all these. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you do need to have a sizable portfolio to be able to uh, access to this type of financing. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer. Um, would anyone like to add to that in relation to either their business or generally? So uh, with three minutes to go, I will conclude by asking you the, the big question, and that is uh, what are the main drivers, opportunities, and risks in, in your particular business? And uh, Yongzi Wang, if I could start with you at the other end of the table and we work our way down. Um, what would you see as the, the main drivers, opportunities, threats in, in your business today and in maybe five, ten years' time in the future? A difficult question, I know. Mm. Ziggo 那么也需要就是通过我们一些这个行业这个监管的调整，然后来淘汰一些这个技术落后型的一些船舶。那么从双管齐下来讲呢，我觉得还是更多的需要我们整个行业呢达成一些这个共识和自律，这是非常重要的
ships to carry the cargo and instead rates will be pushed up to a new equilibrium with higher TCE rates. And in our market, the, in the spot market, uh, it's the same for all. So the actual higher fuel cost actually gets passed on to the, to the, to the customer. Yeah. So those are some of the main, main drivers. The, lo the lower uh, supply side is also a major driver, right? Where we do think that people will eventually hesitate ordering new ships and, and wait instead because you, know, yeah. you won't get 25 years out of a heavy fuel oil engine ship. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Bing Chen, uh, what are your views? Yeah, I uh, concur with uh, Yongxin that uh, the challenge is, is discipline. Uh, as an industry, I think uh, we definitely, uh, it's, it's uh, moving towards a more positive demand and supply, but we're not there yet. And uh, we don't know going forward whether the demand and supply side, and we're mostly on the supply side, will remain uh, discipline and that is you know a very very uh, important factor so that is the challenge in addition to the environmental compliance and all the other stuff mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the drivers I, I, I think that uh, you know if we're looking at container space um, the drivers is uh, you know if we're looking at the liners that they have already consolidated rapidly over the past two or three years so from uh, you know over 30 liners today to about 10 liners of which you know seven or eight accounts for 85 percent of the market so the uh, liners today is really looking for their service provider like c-span that you be able to have that kind of flexibility quality and scalability uh, so from the opportunity standpoint uh, we continue to see the consolidation in our space and what about the size of the ship What's yeah, the size of the ship obviously is also moving towards a larger one. It's about 10,000 TEU. I think that's, that's more of a, you know, because the versatility of these type of vessels. Because right now the new build is primarily in the 23,000 TEU space, right? right? So from a, from a consolidation standpoint, and I think uh, today, you know, if you're looking at C-SPAN with the recent announced acquisition of six vessels, um, we are... Uh, going to have, uh, you know, the TEU capacity close to 1 million. Uh, it's 975,000 TEUs uh, to be exact. And with this capacity today, we are only accounts for about 8% of the market, 8% of the market. So therefore, the market is extremely fragmented. So if you're looking at from both, you know, from operational efficiency, from a resource perspective, I think the market should be consolidated. And also, from a customer perspective, uh, I think the liners today are looking for partners that who has that kind of, uh, you know, scalability, quality, and flexibility. Thank you. Um, Jack, what, what, are, what are your views of the drivers, opportunities, threats today and possibly in the future? I think um, it was touched upon earlier in our discussions is that, in my opinion, I think the key driver in the next, uh, let's say, three, four years, possibly five years, uh, clearly is uncertainty. Um, until IMO comes up with a, a, a tangible framework that is um, enforceable and practicable, uh, and how that impacts the alternative fuel source uh, solutions, that may take a few years as well, as well in terms of uh, experimentation and build out of the infrastructure of the supply of the uh, new fuel source. Um, so we're looking at perhaps uh, five to seven years of uncertainty. And in that environment, I believe it's all about uh, where the macroeconomic cycles in shipping will take shipping in terms of its freight cycles. And so um, to me, I think um, from a financial modeling perspective, a new building definitely is very risky, not only because of its obsolescence, but just generally with the amount of leverage you can get with no charter cover. It uh, doesn't make sense to deploy capital in that way. And hence, secondhand purchase, resale, I think that's the opportunity. Uh, market cycle is relevant because when market cycles are poor, obviously you have uh, scrapping going on. So in the next sort of three, five, seven years, I see that as a potential driver in terms of uh, continued low um, new buildings um, and also secondhand sale and purchase, building up cash flows in good times and deploying them correctly, uh, event, uh, opportunistically. Thank you very much for that. Actually, that's quite an optimistic note, really, because it sounds to me as if um, supply of tonnage is going to be on the way down, and hopefully the world economy will still be increasing 
uh, despite um, the issues that are going on in the world today. Uh, so that's probably a, a pretty good story. Um, and Hing Zhao, what would your views be? I think the fellow, my fellow panel, panelists have already said a lot. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we're going through a period of uh, great disruptions. First of all, uppermost on everyone's lips is the ongoing trade war between China and America. Um, there are a lot of uncertainties in global geopolitical factors which impact on global trade patterns. Um, as Mr. Wang mentioned earlier, this brought significant challenges, but also opportunities for the future. And in a way, ship owners have always dealt with these uh, waxing and waning of their shipping moon um, over the years. So there's nothing new in that, in a way. But what is new in, our, in the challenges we face is disruptions that come about through technological and environmental regulations and innovations. So I would say, in my view, how we embrace innovation will be one of the most significant uh, challenges as well as opportunity in the way we'll go forward in the future. I think we need to exercise discipline, a word that all my fellow panelists have used. We need to have foresight. I think just to stick to what has worked for shipping for the past years and past decades may not work in the future. We need to be forward-looking. We need to embrace new, uh, new opportunities. We need to review and um, perhaps reinvent the business model and um, with all these things combined hopefully we'll um, make the right decision when we make investment in assets thank you very much obviously a lot of work to do yes thank you and if you could give a round of applause please.